Acts chapter 2 from verse 22, and I will read to verse 24. The subject for our consideration today is, we are, we are going to the series of the uh, Peter Pentecost uh, preaching, and today is Jesus of Nazareth, a man. Verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, losing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, let this entrance minister grace to myself and to my hearers today. Grant that your word come in its fullness and power over this holy convocation. And let your word come with proof, evidence. Let it come with healing and strength and chastisement. Let your word wound us and let your word heal us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please, may you return to your seat. So, today is the last Sunday, month of July. And as uh, we have kind of, today is the first time we are doing this, this Q&A afternoon service. Those of you at the corner, I hope you can see me. Uh, Q&A, it is, our intention is that it is not a good thing to continue teaching, 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 and there is no feedback. So, once in a month, we will come together and reflect over the four or six, seven sermons of the month. And if there are issues that you are not comfortable with or you don't understand, you can raise them up and then explanation, answers will be given. Preaching is not entertainment. Preaching is that you learn. And through the learning of the word of God, you are made conformable to the image of Christ. As we, we come to the scripture, to the word of God, we are made more like Jesus. And that we ourselves will be able to testify, and those who are looking at us can testify that indeed we have been with Christ. That is the goal. If you need entertainment, there are various places. There are various places for it. There are various places for entertainment. I mean, I will not give you the list, but if you Google, there are a lot of places you can go today. You will laugh. You will laugh. And then you will enjoy yourself. But the house of God is where you are helped to know God. And through knowing him by his word, you'll be more like Christ. Amen. I hope you understand that now. So at the end of this service, we'll just take 30 minutes to stretch. 30 minutes to stretch. Eat your snacks. I've asked to bring your sandwiches. If you come with sandwiches or whatever you came okay, with, some Coke, you just drink them, stretch, use the bathroom. Then we come back and spend extra hour. Then I'll take questions from you. And we should be out of this place and if by the grace of God there are no questions, I'll just run through by way of summary, and then I'll dismiss us. we we'll go home today. Therefore, there will be no evening service today. Okay. Is that good enough? 
is good and is better. So we can go home and also enjoy our evening with our families uh, around the word of God. The portion of Acts chapter 2 where we are today, Peter, who is the preacher here, is moving away from the Old Testament now to the prophecy of Jewel to Jesus. And just by way of mentioning, every adventure in the scripture in the Old Testament must inevitably lead one to Christ. You must find a way to get to Christ. And that's what Peter is doing. He has given an explanation uh, to the phenomena of speaking in, in all the languages as had happened on the day of Pentecost. He has given that explanation and he is saying this phenomena is what Prophet Jewel uh, said many, many, many hundreds of years ago. It's about that in the last days, God will pour his spirit on all flesh. So the day of Pentecost was an inauguration, the age of the Holy Spirit, where God will fill his people, poor, slave, rich, have and have not, female, male, whoever you are, across divides, God will pour his spirits on all flesh. Not just giving, pouring. It means we are in the age of the abundance of the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Godhead. So he's moving from Joel now to Jesus. He's saying that this Jesus uh, is a man. And every sound gospel presentation will have this component of the fact of the humanity of Christ. So today, Peter is looking at the humanity of Christ, and then by next time, when he moves to David, and he's quoting the Lord, sit to my Lord, sit at my right hand, he's, he speak more about his the deity, we'll look at that. But today, let's look at the humanity of Christ. Men of Israel, he said, this Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God. He is a man. In fact, the New Testament, uh, one of the marker of false prophet is that any spirit that deny that Jesus comes in the flesh, if you preach that Jesus is not truly man, is heresy. Jesus is truly man. And the reason why we need a man, why God needs a man, is for our redemption. We have sinned. Adam sinned, and sin had come upon us by human generation, by natural human generation. Uh, we need an atonement. We need a human representative that will stand between God and man. We need a human representative that is sinless, that is pure and unstained from iniquity and the sin of Adam. And God gave us his son. And his son is none other but his only begotten son, the second person in the Godhead, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was inhumanized in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and he lay there for nine months and he came out like us. When he came out, he was just like any baby. There was nothing, there was nothing so amazing about this baby when he came out. He came out like us. He didn't come out with the mouth of Mary. He didn't come out, he didn't come out with the ear of Mary to show that he, he was supernatural. He came out through the normal process of delivery, though it was not a cesarean section. It was normal delivery. What is normal delivery? Sir? All deliveries are normal deliveries. No? So he, he came out the way we all came out. And he was like us. Because we need a man. We need a kinsman redeemer. Never forget that. We need a man. We need a brother. 
We need someone that can stand on our behalf and, bo and be uh, the punishment of God and therefore atoning for our sin. You should not forget that. So the fact of his humanity is seen in three ways as we look at these few portions of the scripture. In the fir first place, we see his humanity by the fact that God needs to validate him. His validation shows that he is truly human. Men of Israel, this Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested, that is another word for validation, attested, proven to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. The fact of his personhood was known to everybody. He was from Nazareth. That if you lived in Nazareth those days, you will know his father, Joseph. You will know his mother, Mary. You will know his occupation, carpentry. You will know something about him. And because this Messiah have to, ought to be a man, he needs some validation that is so special uh, from any other human beings. So God worked through him by signs and wonders to validate that he is a man in need of God. So when he came here as a man, he, was, he did not take up his power automatically and begin to move around as a superman. In his obedience to his father, he, he submitted himself to his father so that God could walk through him. He was a man in need of God working in him. God was working through him. He himself mentioned again and again that it is the father that is working through him. He didn't say, guys, you know, there are three persons in God's head. You know? You do know there are three persons in God's head? As you are seeing now, now one of them stand before you now. If you never know. Those three persons in God's head, while one of them, they now. Now me full ground now. And then those who want to talk to him, he will do like this. Their neck will just go to one corner. Say, make a show and say, I'll be the second person in God. You know? He was humble. He was meek and lowly. And was in complete dependence on God. He would pray all night. He would fast for 40 days. Just like us. And God was working through him. And it was evident that there was a power mediated to him by the Holy Spirit from God. And he was not taking up his divine power willy-nilly to prove any point. He was not proving any point. He was independent on God. God is working through him. God raised him. He was a man in need of God. Because he was a man, he needed validation. Okay? God validated him. And this validation has two elements. One, that to show that he's really a man. Secondly, to show that he is the Messiah that Joel or the other prophet prophesy about. That when he comes around and is doing what no other person can do, Israel will know for sure that this is our Messiah. And there were many things he was doing that no one has ever done. He walked on water. None. No one has done that. Uh, no one. Uh, of course, there are some prophets that have tried to walk on water. And uh, that's another story for <laughs> another day. And then he walks on water. He raised the dead. He turned water to wine. 40 days, no food, no water. Sustained in the wilderness. Sustained in the wilderness. You know, there are some human beings that run their mouth around. They will tell you, if you want to have the power I have, go and fast for... Uh, but let me even check before I run my mouth. How many of you have done 40 days dry fasting before? Raise your hand. Oh, no one. None. You know, when a man comes and is bamboozling you with some spirituality, that he has done 40 days and 40 nights in prayer and fasting, no food, no water, don't believe him. 
Trust me. Except you are in the same room with him. Oh, except you are in the same room. See, I, I'm, I'm old enough to know these things. Medically speaking, you can't go. Some people actually go for 40 days prayer and fasting, but they were having some fruit in between, isn't it? Some warm tea in between. Some, some things in between. We are talking about the man, except Moses that was with God for 40 days and Christ 40 days in the wilderness. You know, I have mentioned to you before, in those days, we we'll we'll try to go for seven days. If I, those three days dry fasting, those seven days dry fasting, almost walk hypocrite. If I, that's, the, that's the beginning of my learning how to be a hypocrite. Because you are as a young Christian, you are desiring. You see, smart is a big Christian. He can go seven days twice. You want to be like brother smart, who is always seven days. Oh, smart, the chop guy in the toilet. I saw it. <laughs> Not this smart, okay? <laughs> yeah. okay. So he, he was doing what no man can do. No man. No man ever lived before him and after him was able to do what this man did. To show that he is the only Messiah. Now, there are some of you that also run your mouth around. Jesus said, if you believe in me, the works I do, you will do it and uh, you greater one, greater works. Which greater works? Which greater works can you do? Well, even Jabi Lake, let's go and work on it. Which greater works? How many dead can you raise? Oh, go to the cross and see. Let's bury you for three days and see. You see, I think you should know boundaries. Jesus, as a man, was in a class of his own. As a Christian, you must understand that. That Jesus is never your mate. You know, some people even use Jesus to do comedy these days. What, what, what? You know, Islam has been around for 1,600 years now, roughly. And guess what? You know, the reason why many of you are falling prey to Satan is that you don't understand how spirituality works. Islam originally was like a branch of Christianity was a charismatic, functional, deviant form of Christianity. Call, you go to the mountain, you go to the cave, you come back with, with visions, you are denying the, the three personhood of God. That theology, uh, today we have uh, charismatic and Pentecostal theology. At that time, that theology is called Nestorian, Nestorianism. Is the idea uh, that the, when you are denying one thing, other things follow. But guess what? Islam has been so boring from day one, isn't it? When you go to pray in the mosque, do you change the prayer? No. Eh? If you pray five times a day, what are you praying? How many things are you saying? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. And it continues to grow. And recently, one young musician that is from a family, if you come to the, that man's family, the person you think is a Christian is actually a Muslim. And the person you think is a Muslim is actually a Christian. In fact, in his family, they go to mosque and they go to church. I'm not calling anybody's name. And then he now use, not even the name of Muhammad, he used a mosque building for his music. Now you know who I'm talking about. And somebody even sat on the macro on the speaker of the mosque and was dancing. That guy now is running away for his life. You see, what is holy? You don't play with holy things. You don't. What is sacred is sacred. There was no man like Jesus. You must adore him. And fear him. And let your neighbor know that this man, this man, is in class of his own. Amen. Amen. 
we see his humanity in the fact that men violated him. They violated him. This Jesus, verse 23, delivered up according to the death of the plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. The reason why Judas was able to betray him, the reason why Caiaphas was able to sit in judgment and talk about him and drag him and the Roman soldiers kicked him was that he, he is truly a man. <laughs> you cannot arrest God. You cannot. If not now that people can arrest masquerade, in those days you cannot, you cannot arrest masquerade. God's, uh, God's cannot be violated. You can't violate God. But because there is a condescension being made like unto us, he was arrested, he was violated. And this violation comes by the hand of what the Bible calls lawless men. The reason why their actions were lawless is that in the days of his humiliation, every known law were broken. They were jealous. They were angry. They had no pity on him. They screamed, crucify him, crucify him. They sought that his blood may rest upon them and their children. They violated him. They almost skinned him alive. God, he, he cried. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. He wept. They flogged him. God does not cry. I hope you understand. God does not cry. God does not die. He is truly man. He was violated. And this violation has just two parts. One was that the lawless men, moved by sheer jealousy, came upon him and buffeted him. But behind their action, the other part is that God was working. God was using their wickedness to save us. So you see the balance between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Those who were killing him were killing him out of wickedness and callousness. They were culpable. If your neighbor is sleeping, help them. This place is quite warm. Okay, help those who are falling asleep. No, who are trying to sleep. Hmm. He was violated by men and was forsaken by God at this point. Isaiah 53 tells us that. He was truly a man. He suffered. And the reason for this suffering is that people were wicked. They don't, our sinfulness, the sinfulness of man came to the fore in the death of Jesus, isn't it? That we are wicked. We are wicked. Outside the restraint of God, when we want to show our wickedness, we are truly wicked. Oh, we can put tires on people's neck and pour fire. There's nothing we cannot do in terms of wickedness. We are so wicked. And when you look at the cross, it is a revelation of how, how bad we can. You know, some of us used to deceive ourselves that if we are good, people will like us, isn't it? Hmm? If we are good, you are, you are digging borehole in all the communities of Nigeria, you have, people will like you. Is that the case always? No. Sometimes the fact that you are good offends people. That's how bad we are. Because in us, dwelleth nothing good and no good things can flow out of a wicked heart a tree is known by its fruits there is no way mercy justice righteousness could flow out of those guys that were killing Jesus because it is, 
It wasn't in them. What God demands of us is greater than us. We cannot show mercy. We cannot in and of ourselves so show justice and equity. We are wicked by nature. And by nature, aliens to the, to the life of God. In the death of Christ, human wickedness and debauchery came to the fore. And we also see the demonstration of how God can use the wickedness of men for greater good without excusing their wickedness. God came through because it has been predetermined. The death of Christ falls within what we call the definite plan of God. Oh, the day he died, the action of his death the agency of his death were predetermined. It was definite. So they did not come upon him in their own mind. They thought they came upon him by accident. Oh, but in the mind of God, they came upon him working out the predetermined counsel of God. He was truly man. He needed validation. He was violated. And finally, he was vindicated. He need God to raise him. Verse 24. This Jesus, God raised him up, losing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. As he lay in the tomb, he trusts God for his own resurrection. And that's the testimony of the scripture. He didn't say, of course, he mentioned to the disciples that after three days, I will, I will come back to life. But the entire testimony is that Jesus believed God that he would not let him rot in the grave. And that is the subject for another day. David foresaw the humiliation of Christ and he said, in, in his, and he said, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. His bones shall not be broken. And when he was given up the ghost, he said, Father, into your hand I commit my spirit. So he needed this, the father, to deliver him from the grave. So he delivered him from the hands of lawless men by vindicating him and show that he was an innocent man. The resurrection of Christ is a proof that he was sinless because grave cannot hold those who are without sin. It was impossible for the grave to hold him there because there was nothing Death come by what? Sin. The part of death is sin. There is no way death can sustain a sinless man. There is no way grave can keep a sinless person. Oh, what a man our brother Jesus is. A man that depends on God. Violated by men. Vindicated of God. Is the savior you have come to know. And the reason why the gospel is important is that all these things that happens to him happens to him because of you. That if you but keep your trust and faith in him, you will be saved. He is the Messiah. He is the only Messiah. There is no salvation in any other except in Christ Jesus, the man. If there is any Christ Jesus, the spirit is not the Christ Jesus, the Messiah. The Christ Jesus that is worthy of your trust is the Christ Jesus that was truly man. And I'm using the word truly man. You know, recently, Brother Ayodeji posted on his Facebook wall, you know, and when Aushis Prower was kind of correcting John MacArthur, John MacArthur has used the word fully God and fully man. Of course, I use that a lot. We use that a lot. And also Sproul said, it's better to use the word truly God and truly man. That's another story for another day. Okay. Christ was truly man, truly, truly man like us. He was not a phantom. He was not pretending to be a man. He was truly man. When he walked here, it was a risk. It is risky for the divine to become man, to walk among wicked men. It was risky for him to stay in the womb of a virgin Mary. It was risky. But he depends on God. 
the core area of his humanity is in his obedience. He obeyed his father by being dependent on his father completely. Without saying, Oh, father, I'll be waiting for you to do this thing. We are not coming on time. Let me move. Just as we do. Example. You know, you know the kings of Israel were pictures of Christ to come. I hope you understand that. There was, the first one was Saul. And God told him, wait for me seven days before you go to war. He waited and God didn't show up. Somebody didn't show up. He said, uh, he waited. Okay, well, <laughs> is it not to kill animal and burn it? We can do it. Give me matches. <laughs> and then he was sacrificing. And someone said, so what are you doing? He said, hey, you delay in coming. Jesus was the man that waited on his father. And his father worked through him. And therefore, validate him to be the savior that the world need. If you are a Christian, if not done bad market, you have come to the real man, the real deal, the real savior. Your sin has been washed away in this man. He took upon himself the entirety of your sin. He drank the wrath of God and then he nailed them to the cross and gave you liberty and righteousness that you never had. And you can praise God for that. There's an imputation of the righteousness that you can never acquire from anywhere in you today because of Christ Jesus. He's a man like you. A man like you. And we can praise God. So not a believer. Let me just tell you very quickly that it's no, nothing like an unbeliever. We all believe in something, isn't it? Even those who claim to believe in nothing, actually believe in, a, <laughs> in something. Oh, they believe. Forget, forget about these things. You know, Ole uh, Shoenka used to pride himself as a humanist. He's an, he's an atheist and a humanist. He does not believe in God. But look at his, some of his novels. And look at his, some of his recent, now he's, he's in his 80s now. The man now is even conversing for a holiday for Ifa worshippers. Why? Because behind the scene, Wole Shoka himself is an Ifa devotee. We believe in something. Oh, nothing stands on nothing. No. We believe in something. There's something that your heart is resting on today. Is that your money in the bank account? Or the promise that you're going to jackpot soon, your brother is in the US, he will send you money. There's, a, there's something somewhere that your faith is hanging on. The reason why you are doing kim, 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 kim this morning is that when you see a man walking on the, I have joy, it's not for nothing. Something had happened. Some even put their whole trust in their marriage, in their husband, in their wife. And some put their trust in some baba. Oh, goodness. God dealt with me these past days. Eh? I came to a point where I was trying to be a man. Oh, of course, I'm a man. Full-blooded man. And it is good to have one God. Hush. Let's have one God. So I look here, I look here, I look here, I look around. I, there's only one God that I have. So I, I, I just, I was trying to be a man. And I walked towards my car, and I, my key just fell. And I was on my knees, and I was crying. And I said, Father, what are you doing? And I said, you know, you know I have no any other person beside you. And I said, God, this has been proven again and again, again and again. I, 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 I was speaking like a fool because God knows my heart. I'm telling him that as if he doesn't know my heart. What, what, what do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Those that can afford the best Medicare are in the mortuary. A day will come the best hospital in this city will fail. If they can fly you to America for Medicare through the uh, air ambulance, 
It has failed. It has. Education has failed people. And of course, if I has ah, several times, if I has failed, several times, you eat anti gun medicine and become a thug. It works for some times. Maybe I don't even know where you ever work. One day, boom, you are down. How if I fail? If I has failed several times. You see this guy around around these are Muslim friends or our neighbors. You know where their hope is hanging on? If I can but pray five times every day. Religiously. Without, that's why when they stand for prayer, they are running. Because if you pray five minutes after the time, it, it doesn't really have uh, quality. You pray five times. I give arms. I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. If I die, my good works will speak for me. Good works done by men doesn't speak anything when it comes to salvation. You <laughs> go go for your hand. You, you open your eyes, you are in heaven. You look for your good works. You are not even in heaven. You are just somewhere. You look for your good works as you are as you are trying to end yourself, but let's go. You are looking for your good works to carry you along. Zero. And your maluk will ferry you straight to hell. Trust me. The day my wife delivered, I, I was greeted. I was just coming in. My wife was, was checked in. And then there was this very rich man that was brought in dead on arrival. His family. The, one woman said, God, you don't shame us. No, have you been in the family for where one man is the, is the breadwinner? Eh? Is, the, is the all in all. And trust how God normally works. There's one man in the family. Everybody is, uh, the rest of you are leech. Sucking him, eh? One to go say, come, come make you rest. Yes. Senators, governors, commissioners, they will die. It is that you consider Christ by natural generation. There is nothing in you that can connect you to God. You are separate from God. You are alienated from God. You need a mediator. You need a sacrifice. You need an imputation. You need a way. You need a righteousness. You need a man. And the scripture is clear. There is salvation in no other. If you are not in Christ, if you think your intellect, you have read seven books of Moses, you have read 48 laws of power. Oh, Robert Green has fed many people. You have read uh, 48 laws of power, you have a law of seduction, and then you are moving around. It will fail. I encourage you today to come to Christ. Let me just run some sort of application for our own benefit as we face this week. Amen, church. Amen. Amen. Are you with me up to this point? What I have preached to you now is an objective truth. Take it or leave it, isn't it? There's nothing you can do about it. It is what it is. Christ is a man. Man of God. Let's talk about ourselves. What Christ did was not an it was not it was just an abstract reality. He those who are Christians, he gave them his life and his righteousness. The way God validated Christ by signs and wonders, God normatively, usually, validate Christians by the life of righteousness that they possess and exude. You cannot say I am a Christian and there is no sign. All the Old Testament prophets will have a sign. The sign of a prophet. 
all the apostles have what they call the sign of the apostles. Jesus does have a sign that attests to his messianship. Every Christian does have a sign that proves that you are a genuine believer and it is in good works. There must be a marker that when a Christian is standing here and a non Christian is standing here, there is a clear, like day and night. There is no concord between light and darkness. When Christians behave like unbelievers, worldliness. No, we are not being marked out. The church is the called out one. The church is the kaleo of God. We are different. Example, when God will show us a prototype of a church, he called a nation called Israel. God was so particular about Israel so from the food they put in their mouth, how they shave their beards, the clothing on their skin, everything about them was prescriptive. To show, just to show that these guys are not the same as the Canaanites. There is something that is called non-Christian music. There is something that is you must know that Christians don't eat this one. If you don't have a marker, don't fool yourself. You maybe you are not a Christian yet, or you are diminishing the value of your redemption. There must be a mark. There must be a validation. How do you know you are a Christian? The inward purity that runs through your, your heart, your affections, your new affections, your love for the church and God's people, how you pray and how God answers you. You know, there must be a proof that I am a child of God. No proof, there will be issue. Secondly, you know, if you read this scripture, who killed Jesus? God or men? Today is Q and A. We will get there. Who killed Jesus? Men or God? Or both? Okay, let me give you A, men. B, God. C, God and men. D, none of the above. E, all of the above. Okay, let's start now. Who killed Jesus? A, B, C, D, E. Yeah. <laughs> Why well, are you giving you all your smiles now? Who killed Jesus? You don't want to blaspheme the name of God now. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Who killed Jesus? You say those, let me tell you who killed Jesus. Judas, Caiaphas, uh, Roman soldiers, Bobo, Tibo, all of them, they, killed, they conspired. It, it was an accident. There'll be plan to kill Jesus from, for, it took almost three years of his life when he came into public ministry. They met and said, Guy, <laughs> this guy's getting popular. Our ministry is dying. In fact, John the Baptist's disciples went to John and said, John, what are you doing? The man that you baptized the other time, everybody is going to him now. They were full of, in fact, when, they, when, when, when Pilate was examining him, they looked for witness, they couldn't find witness, they looked for witness, they couldn't find witness. It's, but see, Pilate recognized that it's just, it's just pure jealousy. There was no case. They conspired, they planned it, money was paid, they arranged soldiers, they arranged talks, they have vigilante from the temple. It was arranged. Every details of that crucifixion, uh, of that uh, uh, humiliation was arranged. They killed him. Who sold Joseph to slavery? His brothers. That's the same thing. But when the brothers came to Egypt, what did Joseph tell them? He said, it's not you that sold me. It was God. Where Christianity 
fail people is our inability to understand God's sovereignty on one hand and human responsibility on the other hand. What, sister, you don't know, so like, anyway. so I've learned when I was much younger that Judas should not be in hell, that if not for Judas, Christ would have died. And if, well, yes, let's just turn it around. What if Judas was a nice man? I didn't betray him. What if? What if the whole people in Nazareth liked him and nobody crucified him? And Christ must die. It was written that he must die. So those who kill him were helping us, isn't it? They were helping us, they were helping God's self. No, that's, that's wrong thinking. They were wicked. They were wicked. And they were responsible for their actions. But God, God was walking behind the scene for our good. Amen. So when you are faced with temptation, the wrong place to run to is God's sovereignty. God has used bad situation for good, true or false. And Paul said, so if that's the case, let's go and do bad so that good can come. That's the wrong thinking. That God uses a bad situation for good does not mean let's multiply our evil doing so that God can show himself faithful. If you are a wrong guy or a wrong man and something happened along the way and maybe after a while something good came out of that your wrongs. You cannot. You must be ashamed of yourself. The testimony time, blessing time. Brothers, you know, when I was pregnant, this my this, people were laughing at me. Blah 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 blah. Now my dad, my son is now graduated from Yale University. He's now the governor of uh, blah blah blah. Oh, praise the Lord. So because your indiscipline gave birth to a baby that's now a president. Let all the single sisters start having children out of wedlock so that their children can become president. That's not how it works. Whatever evil you practice, you are responsible for it. You can't even blame Adam. Oh. I've seen this in church. I, I heard that before when I was much younger. Anytime he did something, so, oh, for Adam. I mean, the man is before the elders. They are about to judge him. He will start crying. He will never say, Adam, 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 Adam. How I wish you were righteous. How will I be righteous? Elders, when I kill me, it's Adam. But kill me, kill me. You know it's Adam. And my father says, shut up. Shut up. Adam, 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 where? So Adam, make you slap your wife. It's the sin of Adam. Of course we know. Now, apart from Adam's fall, you won't do all this misbehavior. We know that. But grow up, brother. When you mistreat your spouse and steal and lie and cheat, you are responsible. And you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You will not answer. You will not say, Christ will not say, Adam, happy. Adam, where? Adam, where? Stop sinning. Grow up. God is sovereign. You are responsible. Sometimes, church, are you still with me? Yes. Allow me. I have a baby boy. <laughs> I'm preaching from my heart. Allow me. Sometimes, people take God for granted. You are sick. You won't go to the hospital. I stand on your promises. None shall be barren. I stand on your promises. I shall be heard until things get worse. And then by the time you get to Wabada, the cancer has spread. God heals. Oh God, take your medicine. Take your life seriously. So you are eating all the junk so that God will make you lose fat weight. No, no. It doesn't work like that. Take hold of your life. In Christ Jesus. And honor God. God is sovereign. There are some things you are doing here. Finally, when this life comes to an end, God will vindicate us, isn't it? For those of us who encourage Jesus, 
grave and death will not hold us. There will be this shout, grave, where is? Oh, death, where is your stink? And grave, where is your power? The power of death is sin. But thanks be to Jesus, who became sin, so that I can become the righteousness of God. When this life is over, my eyes shall see God. Death will not hold me in the grave. Because death cannot hold an innocent man. Father, let this word sink into our hearts. That we may live rejoicing in the light of this truth. And live responsibly in the light of this truth. In Jesus name.